Good morning. My name is Steve Kripe, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of this congregation. Welcome to all of you, especially our guests from UCC. The Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Elkhart is a welcoming community. We encourage religious freedom, nurture individual spiritual and ethical growth, celebrate diversity, and promote contributing to a just and sustainable world. If you would like to learn more about our fellowship, please look at our website at uufe.org and join us after the service for our coffee hour. We meet in the gathering place through the, through the photo gallery, and today we have a special treat uh, dedicating our, our parking lot. We'll celebrate that there, and we also got a new roof this week. For the listening German of all, we ask you at this time to please turn off your, or set your cell phones to vibrate mode. Also, if you need any hearing support, please ask for help at the sound desk located in the back of the room. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Judy Darnell, for people who don't know me, and I'm here with the announcements. Uh, you, may, you may remember that Charlie Bussard is at Timbers in Dwajak. If you would like to send him a card or letter, the address is still on the bulletin board by the ladies' room. Mike Dardent now, Secretary of the Board, reports that the proposed changes to the bylaws will be available within the next couple of weeks, so be sure to pick up your copy. Mike also reports that the roof repairs are done, and he and I will put up the mitten tree sometime this week, and we will begin decorating them during coffee hour next Sunday. So bring warm gloves, mittens, scarves, socks, and other winter items to adorn the trees. The trees will be available for additional adornments until the end of the year when the decorations will be taken to the women's shelter. Ken Claiborne reports that Science and Society will be on hiatus during December, but will reconvene in January. So watch the focus in the weekly update for program announcements. <coughs> Worship and Arts uh, Committee reports that they and the Reverend Jimmy Clifton are preparing a Christmas Eve service for 7 o'clock on Saturday, the 24th, with cookies and other treats afterwards. So bring uh, some of your favorite treats to share if you'd like. Then in lieu of a Sunday service on the 25th, Laura Snow is hosting a potluck dinner. She will be available for more information. Last week's offering of $97 was shared with the Boys and Girls Club of Goshen. This week's will be shared with Church Community Services. And Dwight Fish is here with an update from the search committee. Now, I paid them. <laughs> this is a dramatic effect. This is. Uh, um, my name is Dwight Fish, and good morning to you all. The, the thing I was going to do just didn't quite work out, but that's okay. We got a funny out of it anyway. Um, I couldn't, couldn't. This is a report from our search committee. Um, and Oksana said, keep it simple, so I'm trying to. Um, this is a, um, a report from the search committee that will reveal the truth about the survey that was recently completed uh, by the members of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Elkhart. Uh, first of all, we, the search committee, which is William Becker, T.J. Shom, and Laura Snow and myself, would like to thank Mike Puro for analyzing and calculating the data pulled from the surveys. I don't know some of you are not our members here, but we welcome you. And uh, this will be over in just a minute. It won't be so. Um, Mike used his professional training and experience to give us the most neutral result possible, but effective result. We appreciate the time Mike spent to move this, this information to completion and keep us on track for the greater UUA, Unitarian Universalist Association, search process. The timeline for the minister search process uh, begins in mid-December next month and will conclude around May of 2023. That's the formal stuff. Secondly, we would like to thank you, 
our members for completing the surveys. The answers we received helped guide us, help guide the conversation and search process to reveal the truth as we know it. Of course, you know, Unitarians are always questioning things. We have been since what, 1632 or some crazy time back then. For those congregants present who may not be members, we appreciate your patience as we wade through the data develop our search profile and continue to move past the recent COVID vacuum and minister transition. I've got to admit that our future looks bright as we share together our love of all things UU and develop a healthy and responsive fellowship that lives up to its uh, covenant and our seven guiding principles, maybe soon to be eighth guiding principle. You and me, you and me are the church. Our methodology was driven by the survey we provided a few weeks ago. The 10 questions turned into written responses. Written responses turned into a rating level for topics and then into simple synopsis of how we felt while taking the survey. For example, things like pastoral care, fellowship life, social justice, all received a level of interest that became a data point. God, isn't this gripping? <laughs> this, this, this is, oh. I get chills. I get chills. <laughs> Copies of this final report are available for your review on the Ivy Island, which is right out here with all the stuff on it, the bells and everything. Earlier in the year, many of the congregation participated in small group meetings to take a snapshot of how we felt at the time shortly after COVID and our minister transition. Our UUA consultants suggested this process to see what we as a congregation needed and the work that went into the first data gathering exercise, and it is greatly appreciated by the board members. So that's it for now. The search committee has been meeting regularly and our work continues. We don't need to bore you with another report like this, but we will keep you up to date on our progress in finding a UU minister. Don't forget, love is the spirit of this church and we believe that this is what drives all of us to find the best person for our spiritual need. In peace, respectively submitted the UUFE search committee. Thank you. We ring the gong three times, once for those who came before us and made a place for us. Once for those who are here now. And once for those who will follow and build on the dream. Our chalice lighting this morning comes to us from Pat Urabe Lichty. We light our chalice this morning knowing that our hope and passion are needed to change the world. We bring different gifts to the task, but we are united in this one faith that what we do makes a difference in our world and in ourselves. Please join with me in our unison covenant, which is in the order of service and on the screen. Yes. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and love and to help one another. This is our covenant. And now let us join in our first hymn, number 34, though I may speak with bravest fire.
stand and uh, if you're nominated, please to sing in our first song. <coughs> The facts of life, <laughs> that you were born and you will die, that you will sometimes love enough and sometimes not, that you will lie if only to yourself, 
that you will get tired, that you will learn most from the situations you did not choose. But there will be some things that move you more than you can say, that you will live, that you must be loved, that you will avoid questions most urgently in need of your attention, that you began as the fusion of a sperm and an egg of two people who once were strangers and may well still be, that life isn't fair, that life is sometimes good and sometimes better than good, that life is often not so good, that life is real, and if you can survive it well, survive it well with love and art and meaning given where meaning scarce. That you will learn to live with regret. That you will learn to live with respect. That the structures that constrict you may not be permanently constraining. That you will probably be okay that you must accept change before you die, but you will die anyway. So you might as well live, and you might as well love. You might as well love. You might as well love. There is another church in Elkhart that has a liberal welcome approach, vision that in many ways is similar to ours. For the last seven years, it's, it's been led by Pastor Izzy and it is my great joy to introduce her once more to our pulpit. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I wanna first have us pause to offer gratitude to the Potawatomi, the Kaskakia, the Kickapoo, the Peoria, and the Miami, whose lands we now inhabit. And if we could, let's honor them with just a moment of silence. Thank you. I did something rare for our reading this morning, uh, I actually watched a video that was put out by the National Museum of American Indians. And a guy by the name of Paul Chat Smith, who is a Comanche and is the co-curator of the exhibit, The Americans uh, at the National Museum, gave this wonderful video, uh, just under five minutes, and I transcribed the entire video and lifted my quote from this video because it absolutely captured exactly what I was looking for for today. It's a little long, I apologize, but we'll get through it. He says, Thanksgiving is about trying to come to terms with this difficult truth about the United States, that the country is a national project that came about at great expense to native people. And it's not enough that we're a good country. We kind of have to be the best country, but native people and African slavery, these two things together are huge challenges to how you process this. 
Smith further explains how we have created a narrative around the events of the first Thanksgiving and goes on to say, pilgrims were writing letters, they were writing journals, they were meticulously detailing what was happening. But even that written account gets lost for basically 200 years and doesn't even emerge until the 1840s when this document is again discovered. And even then, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. It's actually a footnote. And we remember that. We rescue it from being a footnote because that has meaning now. And so by the earliest early 20th century, Indians are indivisible part of what creates the United States. It's not a chapter that happened and was bad and we got over it. We're in your head, we're in your pantry, we're in your garage. This imagery representations, advertising, Thanksgiving says, however imperfectly, we remember Indians. We're remembering Indians. And with all the problems with it, it's still a powerful idea. And it's still powerful to not Photoshop Indians out of the national narrative. A way to start thinking about Thanksgiving differently, which opens up ways for people to become activists and to try to change things, invent some new kind of Thanksgiving. I guess if I were to put myself in terms of this cartoon Indian and all this at Thanksgiving, I'd probably be saying, I'm glad to be here. It's better than the alternative. Wow. Just wow. So I want to tell you a story to kick this off. When I was a teenager, I used to go with my church up to Cades Cove, Tennessee every year during spring break. This was our thing. Our youth director would take us camping. I loved it. But I always felt this, this connection to the land that I never really could explain. As I got older and could drive myself to the mountains, I went as often as I could and it literally felt like I needed to pull the car over as I crossed over from Georgia into North Carolina, Tennessee, and get out and kiss the ground. I didn't understand why. Now, I was adopted. Some of you may know that, some of you don't. And I always wondered where I came from. And when I was in my mid to late 30s, I found my biological family. And one of the things that I discovered in finding my family is that I'm part Cherokee and that my family came from those North Carolina mountains. And it always astounds me when you make that kind of connection, you go, wow, okay, this is why I wanted to pull the car over and get out and kiss the ground. There's this literal connection to place. I still feel that way when I'm in Southern Appalachia. It is, and I've had, oh, I don't know, many opportunities. I could have moved there many times over and I chose not to. I think it's because I wanted to keep that place as a very special place that I went to, not that I got accustomed to. The thing that I know when we came to this country, I think we too were looking for a way to find a place. It's just sad to me that we went about it the way that we did. I want you to think for a second, what is the most iconic memory that you have picture in your mind about that first Thanksgiving? What is it? Hmm? Family, right? What else? Harmony. Food, lots of food. Yes. What else? Pilgrims and Indians, that's it. That's the image, right? We have the pilgrims and the Indians sitting at a picnic table. That's the picture I saw, remember? You remember? As if picnic tables existed then. <coughs> With the turkey and all the trimmings. But that image 
is not the truth. But that is the story that we tell ourselves. I think about the stories that I told myself about my family, about my background, and I think that they're similar. Like we want a narrative in our heads. We want to know who we are, where we came from, what's important to us. And we've told this story for so long that we believe it, we bought it whole cloth. This is, this is the beginning, our humble beginnings from the pilgrims. Oh, that they got along so well and they never hurt a single Indian ever. And then we learn as we get older and we begin to read more expansive books that that was not the story. That was not the story. But I think what Smith captures here is so incredible because he says, even though you kept telling that same nasty story, about where you came from and who your ancestors were. You did not Photoshop us out of the picture. Even in the midst of all of that, you've continued to talk about native people. You've held us right here and you didn't even know it. You've kept us at the center of the conversation. Maybe you've never given it another thought. Maybe that picture of the first Thanksgiving with the pilgrims and the Indians didn't really make that big of an impression on you. But you haven't forgotten that the Indians were there. So we have great forgetters. We really do. We like to forget the things that we don't really want to face. We're good at that. And we like to hold on to the narratives that make us happy, that put a smile on our face, where we can pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, good job, we did it. But I don't think any of us are really smiling about that first Thanksgiving. And yet, and yet, Smith says, it opens up an opportunity for us To remember brings about a shift in our thinking that now is the time that we can create a new thanksgiving. I thought about this this year because of doing this particular service, and I thought, you know what? We're not going to do the traditional thing. We're not going to have turkey on Thanksgiving Day. We waited until the day after to cook our turkey. We wanted to do something just a little bit different. We didn't have the huge spread of food. We're trying to come up with new traditions because I would like just for one year to remember my native background in a different way. You know, I can barely claim that heritage, barely. But it's steeped in my DNA. I know that it's there. I have friends who are much more native than I could ever be. And we have these conversations and we talk about the state of things in this country. I had friends that were camped out at Standing Rock, friends that are fighting for water rights in New Mexico. These are hard topics. And at what point do we write the native people back into the narrative in a way that is meaningful and powerful for them, not just for us. How do we give them a seat at the table? I was so impressed that we now have a secretary of interior who is native. And what better position to offer someone of indigenous heritage That is a beginning, just the tip of an iceberg. 
And I love what Smith says. However imperfectly we remember, we're still remembering. I think we have a long way to go before our indigenous brothers and sisters actually feel included once again in their own land. I remember traveling out to South Dakota with my biological mother after we met. And one of the places that we went to was this little tiny hole in the wall restaurant called the Wooden Knife. It was in the Badlands. Now, I would have never found this place, but she had seen it on the Food Network of all places. She said, we have to go, we have to go to this place. And so we showed up and they're famous for their fry bread. And so we went in and we ordered some fry bread and on the table there, they had a variety of honeys that you would eat with this fry bread. And one of the honeys that they had was a blackberry honey. Now, if you've never had blackberry honey, the only place you can get it is in the Northwest. It is the best honey I have ever had ever in my life. And I've eaten a lot of honey. But we had this opportunity to have a conversation with the owner of this restaurant. And when I say restaurant, I mean, it was not even half the size of this room, very small. And he was so generous with his words. And he thanked us for coming out of our way to come to his establishment. And I remember as we left this place thinking, I should be thanking him, not him thanking me. I should be thanking him for sharing his gift of culture of making this spectacular fry bread and offering it to the world. It's really some of the best I'd ever had. And if you spend any time out in the West at all, anywhere where there are native people and you have a chance to eat Indian fry bread, I really do recommend it. It is, even if you're on a diet, I just you, you just need to put that aside for a minute. You need to taste it and you need to understand what goes into making this fry bread, heart and soul. It's one of the few cultural things that we can get that kind of remind us of our own fair food. But it's so much better. And it made me think about all the other things that we have received from indigenous people that we just don't even acknowledge. I don't know about you, but I like corn. We didn't know about corn till we got here. We've done all kinds of things with corn. In fact, I think if it had not been for those first indigenous people, we would not be sitting here now. We would be dead. And I wonder, I don't know about you, but I do wonder sometimes if they had not been so generous, where would we be today? That's a hard question to ask. And it's something that I hope will keep in the forefront of our minds because their generosity is what gave us the opportunity to thrive. And look what we did with it. We've destroyed the planet. We've cut down so many trees in the name of progress. We've destroyed our waterways. And these were the, the things that made their life what it was. How could we do this to them after they saved us?
and yet it's still powerful not to Photoshop them out of the narrative. See, I think we have a responsibility as a people of faith to own that history, to be real about that history, to really get clear about who we are in relationship to that history, and then to do something about it. And I love that he says quite clearly, we need to become activists. We need to speak up. We need to be very vocal about how we feel about the treatment of indigenous people. For my friends that camped out at Standing Rock, they were grateful for all of the UU and the UCC ministers that showed up because we stood in solidarity with the people and said, you will not pollute these waterways. You will not build this pipeline. You will not, you will not again destroy the land that is so sacred to us. We've allowed you time and time and time again to come in and destroy, and we're not going to do it this time. And we stood with them. And we said, we agree, we are not going to do this. That is a new Thanksgiving. And we have you, you and UCC ministers who are standing with the people down in New Mexico saying, we deserve our fair share of the water. Where's our water? That is a new Thanksgiving. And every time we stand with this people, any people who claim indigenous heritage, any time we help them accomplish anything that is reversing the destruction that we've already caused, that is a new Thanksgiving. It is up to us. It is up to those of us with a conscience to say we refuse, we will not Photoshop Indians out of the narrative. We will keep talking about it and we will keep working for justice. We will keep looking to the future to say, this is your land and this is your gift to us. That is powerful. And that is a new kind of thanksgiving. It is my hope and it is my prayer always that we act as justly and as rightly as we can, that we treat every single person with the dignity and the respect that they deserve. This is who we are. This is what we stand for. This is our new thanksgiving. May it be so. Amen. Okay, yeah, we'll give it back, Marva. So we have a few minutes for um, talk back. Thank you, Izzy. I've been on this side of the Thanksgiving for 10 years now. Did you notice the cartoon in the Elkhart Tooth this week? No, I don't get the The Elkhart Indian Elkhart. is offering uh, welcome to the uh, the pilgrims, and he says, all you undocumented immigrants may now get back in the canoe. Yeah. I love it. Yes. Yes. How can we ever make reparation or anything approaching that to these peoples when we, we just, I mean, we removed them from their land we stole their children and sent them to Indian school and or really white man school, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just don't know how, I mean, it's, I feel the same way I do about reparations for slavery. Right. And that is that there's no possible way you could ever pay people enough for that. Right. 
It's an interesting question. Um, so next year, the um, uh, the United Church of Christ will have their general synod, their big meeting, like you guys have your general assembly. And the Indiana Kentucky Conference, of which we are a part, uh, is uh, introducing a resolution to study reparations. And so I've, I'm part of the board and uh, two, three, let's see, two or three years ago now, um, I introduced a resolution for us to, to uh, bring about anti-racism training throughout our churches in the IKC. And as a result of that work, we developed a task force and that task force then took up the concept of how do we study this concept of reparations? What are we gonna do? I think it. I think that's the, the first step. Like we've got to study it. Can we even ask the question? Can we even have the conversation? What that looks like in the end, I have no idea. Like I've given it a lot of thought, but it's a really complex issue. How do you determine? Does everybody get something? What, you know, 40 acres and a mule, like really? Um, I don't know that that is gonna work now, right? So um, do we empty the coffers in order to pay people? I don't know that that's the solution either, but I do believe, I do believe that, that there are probably a hundred different ways that reparations could be done. And, and I think that it's worth looking at. And I think it's something that we really need to take up now right it's a there's a sense of urgency in me that this is a an, an issue that we need to tackle i do find it interesting though that um native people are not as stupid as we like to make them out to be and they have pulled the wool over the us's eyes on a number of occasions one is all of the gaming licenses that they've gotten and the money that they take from us every time we walk into a casino. I know, and I cheer them on, thank you, yeah. Like, please fleece every last person who, who walks in, like rip them off royally, because this is one way that you can support your people. Um, another thing that I think would be very helpful is now that we do have a Secretary of Interior is to change some of the laws about how they are governed because we still have our hands in too many of their pies and we need, to, we need to take our hands off of their sovereignty because you cannot be a sovereign nation if you have another sovereign nation still muddling in your business, right? And that's part of the issue. One of the things that I have been um, championing against for years is how they are required to pass their land down to um, their descendants which ends up making, if you can imagine an acre of land that was given to somebody and then they have to pass that down. Now each person gets a half acre and then that gets passed down. And then by the time you have a postage stamp size piece of land that you can't do anything with. And so that land ends up coming back to the US government. It's a scam of, uh, I mean, so, like we could make a list, right, of the issues. And I think reparations touch on all of those things. You know, can we, can we give back some of the land? I'd like for them just to get out of the badlands, right? Get out of North Carolina. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if they gave the, the, the mountains back to the rightful owners, right? Um, I'll tell you this story. This is, I heard this and I don't remember where, but there was a woman standing in the checkout line and she was talking on her cell phone to somebody in a foreign language and the guy behind her was getting really frustrated and, and he finally spoke up and said, go back to wherever you came from. And she said, actually, I'm Navajo. You go back to where you came from. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that uh, keeping indigenous people in the narrative is somewhat happening in communications. Over the years, I've seen a disappearance of two mislabeled identity, uh, identifications for indigenous people. Americans, which they are not, and Indians, which they are not. 
and in communications, especially broadcast media, creeping in daily is the word indigenous, mm -hmm. keeping them in the narrative. Right. We have time for a couple of more comments here. Pat? Um, okay, um, there's a movie coming out and it's gonna be a major, major picture show or whatever, it with Robert De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio and it's called Killers of the Flower Moon. And this is going to tell you about the Osage Indians who were moved to Oklahoma during the Trail of Tears. Very, not very great land on a reservation. I was there when they were filming the movie, so. Um, but um, in the 20s, oil was found there, the second biggest oil reserve in the United States. And immediately these Indians were millionaires. But this movie will show in the, how the power, the white powers that be, decided they weren't having that, and over the next 15 years slaughtered these people, these Osage Indians, at least 300 of them. And the, the movie is basically targeted to show that, yes, this was a terrible thing, but out of this came the Federal Bureau of Investigations, our FBI. But I think that a lot of people will be, at least this is a major picture show that's gonna be detailing the massacre, the atrocities, that were inflicted on Native Americans. And I think a lot of people, that will be what they will really walk away with, at least I hope, from this movie. We're gonna let Pam have the last word. I, there were a couple of things. One is South Bend has a reparation group. Uh, the, uh, it's called the South Bend Reparation Working Group. Mm -hmm. And they are actively, very actively working in that. And I'm on their, I'm, I'm kind of halfway in their group and halfway not. Um, so they are doing that. Um, and, and there's also something our government, uh, I'm a CASA. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And right now, if kids are taken out of their homes and they are um, indigenous folks, if they have a indigenous heritage, they go to indigenous foster homes and they are uh and they are within their system but the government i think is now trying i don't know wh which government is trying to take that away and say gee do they really have to stay within their uh within their own group or can we have them mm. and take them which is just taking away one more thing the the last thing i i when you said that they have given us, the indigenous folks have given us so much, it made me also think of the African Americans who have given us so much. Correct. Both of those groups have been so um, generous mm -hmm. in, the, in their giving, and we, we've taken without any kind of acknowledgement of, of what they have given to our culture and to, to the world. And uh, I think that's really sad that we we're takers and they're givers. Right. Yeah, I can't imagine Southern cuisine without the African American influence. Or music. Or music. Or yeah. Music. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things. <clears throat> yes. Thank you all so much uh, for participating today. And I just want to leave you with one one final thought. If you don't do anything else around Thanksgiving, at least light a candle for your indigenous brothers and sisters. Thank you, Izzy. Steve Kripe will lead us in our final hymn. <clears throat> well, I want to say that our guest This hymn might be in for a lot of you, so we're gonna have this. Um, Mount Mount Marvel played all the way through as an introduction. So you stand if you're able and then remain uh, standing for the benediction and then sit for the post. Thank you.
Go now in peace and to serve and love one another, to remember what it means to live a just life, to reconcile our history by living a more just-filled present. May the blessing of truth be upon us. May the power of love direct us and sustain us. And may the peace of this community preserve our going out and our coming in from this time forth until we meet again. Amen. <laughs>